Young Turks has been one of the few uh, media outlets that's covering the National Defense Authorization Act and what a horrible piece of legislation it is. I thought it was one of the worst we've ever passed because it allows for the indefinite detention of U.S. citizens without a trial. Uh, since we've been covering it, we've been getting some criticism, not from Republicans who love it and push for it in the first place, uh, but from uh, Democrats who support President Obama. And they say, how dare you criticize President Obama for this? And you have it all wrong. So two of, uh, of their main arguments against us have been, one, uh, you haven't read the bill. Uh, in fact, the bill does not uh, allow you to do that against United States citizens. And then number two, if it's anybody's fault, it's Congress's fault. Well, let's address uh, both of those. First of all, let's go to the language of the bill, right? Because we've been over this a couple of times. Apparently, people aren't getting it. So they will send us this portion of Section 1021 of the NDAA. And it says this, quote, Nothing in this section shall be construed to affect existing law or authorities relating to the detention of United States citizens, lawful resident aliens of the United States, or any other persons who are captured or arrested in the United States. And they go, aha, you see that? It says it doesn't apply to U.S. citizens. No, you missed two incredibly important sections of that. The first and the last. In the beginning, we'll put it up again, it says, nothing in this section shall be construed, meaning... This does not apply, this exemption does not apply to the rest of the bill. It only applies to Section 1021. And then second of all, it does not apply to United States citizens caught abroad. Okay, It only applies to them here because look at the end of it. It says, who are captured or arrested in the United States. So, now this is about the broad provision of covered persons, right? Which is very, very broad. This is what the these are the people that the military can detain indefinitely without trial, right? So if you're detained outside of the United States, the U.S. citizen exemption does not apply. Now, of course, that makes sense because we've already executed U.S. citizens without a trial uh, abroad. Uh, Awlaki was in Yemen. He's a United States citizen. We dropped a drone on him, killed him. No trial, no nothing. Okay, and. According to this, he's like, well, look, it's, he was abroad, so it doesn't apply. We can do anything we like. So understand what the real language says. Now, Section 1022 is not as broad as covered persons, but it is still broad enough that it applies to anybody that is part of al-Qaeda or associated forces that the president believes is engaged in an attack or planning any attack or thinking about an attack. Now, let's be fair. In any way planning an attack with associated forces of al-Qaeda, which is incredibly broad anyway, right? So in there, though, there's a provision that, uh, you know, reads like this. It says, United States citizens, the, this, uh, the requirement to detain a person in military custody under this section does not extend to citizens of the United States. And people say, aha! Well, it doesn't extend to the citizens of the United States, so what are you guys complaining about? No. Again, you missed the important part, and that highlight that we did over there shows you what the important part is. Glenn Greenwald has done the same thing. It is the requirement to detain a person in military custody under this section doesn't apply to U.S. citizens. In other words, previously the bill had said, if you're a U.S. citizen, the military, and you're suspected of any of this stuff, the military must detain you without a trial. Now it says it's up to the president it's not a requirement anymore. The president can choose to detain you indefinitely, or he can choose to give you a trial. Which means, yes, United States citizens can be held indefinitely without a trial. Now, another thing that confirms this interpretation is the president himself, who in a signing statement, as we showed you yesterday on the program, said, I will choose in my administration not to indefinitely detain U.S. citizens meaning another administration can choose to do so, meaning that the bill says, yes, the president has the authority and the option of detaining U.S. citizens without a trial indefinitely. This is definitive. And it's not just my interpretation. It's not just Glenn Greenwald's interpretation. As we told you yesterday, the team of lawyers at the ACLU, whose job it is to protect our civil liberties, says that is definitely the correct interpretation, and it is hideous. Now today, more people piling on. Uh, Amnesty International, here are their quotes. The bill places enormous power in the hands of future presidents, and the only answer the president has is to say, trust me. And they say that is not good enough when he says in a signing statement, trust me, I will not use the option of detaining people indefinitely without any rights 
whatsoever. That is not good enough. That is not how a country of laws operates. They go on to make even tougher statements. Here's Amnesty International again. Once any government has the authority to hold people indefinitely, the risk is that it can be almost impossible to rein such power in. President Obama has failed to take one action, a veto, that would have blocked the dangerous provisions in the NDAA. In so doing, he has allowed human rights to be further undermined and given al-Qaeda a propaganda victory. So did we all get it wrong? Did ACLU, Amnesty International, all the people who read the bill, and as we just explained to you, showed you the exact content of the bill, that we all got it wrong? No, you're deluding yourself because you want to support the president by any means necessary. Uh, and if you, all those are the people didn't convince you, let's go to Jonathan Turley, well-known uh, professor uh, in, co in constitutional law, uh, trusted progressive. He was livid about this. Here's uh, some of his quotes. With Americans distracted with drinking and celebrating, Obama signed one of the greatest rollbacks of civil liberties in the history of our country. And, cities and citizens partied on blissfully into the new year. This is exactly what we were saying yesterday, saying that he signed it on New Year's Eve so no one would notice. Mission accomplished because almost the rest of the media did not mention it at all. So they just went on their merry ways. And as uh, Jonathan Turley says, the professor uh, of constitutional law, one of the worst rollbacks in our history. He continues, White House conducted a misinformation campaign to secure this power while portraying the president as some type of reluctant absolute ruler, or as, Ob or as Obama maintains, a reluctant president with dictatorial powers. Again, pointing to the signing statement, saying, ah, oh, well, I'm, I don't want to use these powers. Oh, golly gee, Willikers, did I just sign it into law that I have basically dictatorial powers? Now, that seems like harsh language. This is not a harsh guy. This is a guy who's very studied, knows his constitution, and like all the other lawyers commenting on this bill, we can read. He can read. He looks at it and he goes, yes, Fifth Amendment is destroyed. We no longer have due process rights. They can hold us indefinitely without a trial. This is crazy. It is so un-American. And by the way, it's not just the president. It's almost all the Republicans who agreed to this. It is bipartisan agreement in the United States of America, not in the America, I should be clear on that, but in the United States Congress, that yes, we will sell out your rights and we will sell out the Constitution. One more quote from Jonathan Turley. For civil libertarians, the NDAA is our Mayan moment. 2012 is when the nation embraced authoritarian powers with little more than a pause between rounds of drinks. Now, second part of the criticism leveled at uh, detractors of this bill and of President Obama for signing it is, no, you don't understand, uh, Congress was in favor, of his, uh, in favor of it as well. To which I say, of course, of course, but we criticize Congress all the time and we criticize them for passing the bill in the first place. Before, when President Obama was uh, threatening a veto, we were saying that Obama was on the right side. Later, that turned out to be not very accurate because Senator Carl Levin explained, no, President Obama pushed to include U.S. citizens as um, part of his power to detain indefinitely. So we were giving him too much credit earlier, and we were saying Congress was at fault. But look, let's, you want to call, call it what it is, no question about it. The House voted overwhelmingly in favor of this, 322 to 96. The Senate voted 86 to 13. And, uh, and six Democrats voted no, one independent, of course, Bernie Sanders, and one Republican, I'm sorry, six Republicans voted against it. So give them equal credit, those guys, for being on the right side of this. Everybody else went along with this travesty, including so-called liberal or progressive senators. Let me give you a list of all the people who sold us out on this. Barbara Boxer, she's supposed to be a big-time liberal. Dianne Feinstein is not a big-time liberal, but she's the person who introduced the amendments that said this should not apply to United States citizens. They voted that down, which again makes it clear. They said, no, Congress and the president said, we want to include U.S. citizens. We are voting against that amendment, and the president signed it, right? But did that stop Feinstein from voting for it? No, didn't matter. Oh, you're including citizens? Who cares? I'll vote yes anyway. Look at the rest of the list. Mark Udall. Great uh, amendment on campaign finance reform, a disaster here. John Kerry, of course, a 04 candidate for the uh, Democrats. My uh, senators from my home state, Frank Lautenberg and Robert Menendez, always talk about how progressive they are. Sure you are. Look at this. Here comes the worst of the list. 
Sherrod Brown, uh, Democrat of Ohio, Sheldon Whitehouse, Democrat of Rhode Island, and Patrick Leahy, Democrat of Vermont. Why are they the worst on the list? Because these are the guys who claim to be the biggest progressives. Sherrod Brown, you're going to do it again? Remember, before his last election, Sherrod Brown sold out and uh, signed away our rights in the Military Commissions Act. Then he came on the Young Turks and said, oh, that was such a mistake, I won't do it again. Right before his next election, the National Defense Authorization Act comes, and he goes, yeah, who, you need me to sell out again? Oh, my God, I don't want the Republicans to criticize me. Yes, I vote to take away your rights. So are you saying I didn't criticize Congress enough? Was that clear enough? Whether it's the Republicans or the Democrats, they all did something horrible here in taking away an enormous part of our Constitution, and they're all guilty. Was that clear enough?